Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Uh, While I have you here, please consider supporting Youth Empowerment and Support Services, otherwise known as YES. Based in Edmonton, Alberta, YES provides immediate and low-barrier overnight and day shelter, temporary supportive housing, and individualized wraparound supports for young people aged 15 to 24. They work collaboratively within a network of care focused on the prevention of youth homelessness by providing youth with the necessary supports to stabilize their housing, improve their well-being, build life skills, connect with community, and avoid re-entry into homelessness. Learn more about how to donate or otherwise support YES by visiting YESS.org. This is Dmitry Samarov from Chicago, Illinois. And I love listening to Vishkana's creative control because whether he's talking to a favorite musician or actor of mine or someone I've never heard of, it's as if he's introducing me to a new friend. And the way things are going, couldn't you use a new friend? Listen now. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Steve Albini and Fred Armisen are each funny and musical people who have played significant roles in the arts and culture community in Chicago, Illinois. After moving to the area for university some 40 years ago, Albini made a name for himself as the singer and guitarist in bands like Big Black and Shellac, and as a prominent recording engineer, overseeing the capture of thousands of songs and establishing the remarkable independent Chicago studio complex, Electrical Audio. In the late 1980s, Armisen left his native New York for Chicago to pursue music, playing drums in bands like Trenchmouth, and establishing himself as a gifted comedic entertainer, which led to him being a popular and crucial cast member on Saturday Night Live, and eventually launching his own impactful sketch series with Carrie Brownstein, called Portlandia. Albini and Armisen were in the same social circles when Armisen still lived in Chicago, and they maintain a fond friendship, and both are involved in Poverty Alleviation Chicago's annual charity initiative, Letters to Santa, which raises funds to help families in need, and then simply gives those families the money and wish list items they requested directly. In 2023, There are two such Letters to Santa events taking place. On December 5th, John Mulaney headlines Letters to Santa, the Holiday Gala at the Convene Willis Tower in Chicago, which aims to raise $150,000 to help 15 families in need across the greater Chicago area. And then on December 16th and 17th, Letters to Santa, the 24-hour comedy and music marathon, takes place at the Elysian Theater in Los Angeles, which is shaping up to be a star-studded event that people can attend live in person or stream online remotely. To mark these occasions, Steve, Fred, and I connected to have a fun conversation about things like their shared history, their respective interactions with Conan O'Brien, Fred's talents for mimicry, Steve's penchant for comedic logic, Chicago's distinction as a hub for top-tier comedy and music, but also for recording studios, Fred's interest in complicated drumming techniques, the fact that a new shellac album will likely be released soon, other future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this donor-driven podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control. That is the primary source of revenue for all the work that I put into making this show. So if you can donate to the show, please do visit patreon.com slash creative control now. Uh, if you can, thank you with additional support from blackbird music, a wonderful record store with the uh, bricks and mortar locations in Edmonton and Calgary, Alberta. 
And a great website, blackbird.ca, where you can type in what you want, and if they can ship it right to your house, they'll do that. Say you want uh, the, the some music by Shellac or something, or maybe you want to find that uh, complicated drumming techniques uh, DVD uh, that Drag City put out uh, by Fred Armisen or something. Anyway, whatever it is you need, go to blackbird.ca, type it in, and if they can get it to you, they will. It's just that simple. Support independent record stores if you can. Plus, in-kind support from independent businesses like Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario. This is episode 826 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented Steve Albini and Fred Armisen, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Very good, Vish. It's nice to see you again. Always a pleasure. I think I know where in the world you are, but where in the world are you? I am in Studio A of Electrical Audio in Chicago. Lovely. How are things going there? Uh, so far, so good. Nice. That's great. It's always lovely to see you. We have a guest, unusually, and I can't wait to welcome him to the proceedings. Uh, Fred, are you there? I'm here. Nice to see you as well, sir. Where in the world are you? Nice to see you. I'm in Sh- in Leeds, England. I was going to say Sheffield, but I was in Sheffield earlier, and then we drove to Leeds. Wow. And how was yeah. the drive? And even the though it's basically the same place, they get really upset if you confuse them. <laughs> oh, do not. Do not. These are two different cities, half an hour away from each other, 40 minutes away from each other. But yeah, the drive was great. It was, it was okay. great. I was a little worried that I wasn't going to make this in time, but here I am. No, it's amazing. You made a remarkable time. I hope you didn't get a ticket. How is your show? It went great. The, all the shows have been really great. I've never done a British tour, and I love it. I saw, to be honest, Fred, I, I wondered, because I know you're such a big music fan, on your itinerary, are you playing the Cavern Club in Liverpool? Yeah. Is that meaningful for to you? Well, yes and no, and that I think it's like, you know, the Cavern. Well, I don't want to be, I don't want to put it down, but I think I'm sure it's moved over the years, you know what I mean? Like I think oh, it's not the, the first building was, no, I think the first building was destroyed a long time ago. And then I think many venues are that way. Mm. So, well, but, yeah. but anyway, it's really nice. I didn't mean to like, no, no, I, the, I didn't know, know that. Bring it to I, that I, reality. Yeah. But it's just, um, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's almost okay. like if CBGB's got sort of, they opened it up on right. 34th street or something. Right. Well, okay. they have it at LaGuardia, right? They have like a little, a CBGB's. version of it. Yeah, yeah, they they franchise those clubs out. Yeah, I, I think I've heard about this. Uh, well, that's lovely. I'm glad we're all gathered here, and thanks for joining us all the way from England. That's uh, very exotic. And, so uh, be- be- <laughs> before we get into the podcast proper, there's I'm actually very curious about this on a personal level, Fred. I know. I mean, there we're all familiar with the the notion of the Anglophile, like someone who's really into like British things and British culture yes, yes. and like. Like they go out of their way to get that kind of tea or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, biscuits, you know, and, <laughs> yes. but, uh, but the, I get the impression that you are not so much of an Anglophile. That is, you're not so much into like the Beatles and the Stones and punch or whatever, you know, Pims, whatever, but yeah. you're in, you're, you, you like England. That's exactly right. I love it. I love being here. I love walking around. I love the little, like, any building is exotic to me. All the bricks look different. They're, like, yellowish. Uh, The streets, the little, you know, the sound of, like, the cars and little scooters coming around the corner. I love it. I can't get enough of it. I love the countryside here. But you're right. I'm not, it's not like... (laughs) <laughs> biscuit. I, it's not like I need that specific like sausage or biscuit or, or snack. Right, it's right. more that as soon as I land, I think, oh, I just want to stay here. There's something like sort of sort of thicker and chewier about the air, the atmosphere in England. Like yes. it feels like it's Im- imposing on you in a way. Huh? It all looks like it's on film around you. You're like in a in like a a, a movie from like the 70s or something. One thing I've 
I felt when I first started going to England in the 80s, one thing I felt like, you know, you could be walking down just any old ordinary bullshit street and you would feel like that person walking toward you, whoever that random person walking toward you is, that there was something about them that was kind of important and might impact your life. You know, like you always felt like there was some ominous or imposing thing about to occur, you know? Yes. Maybe it's the size of the street. Like something seems like it's about something's about to happen because the streets are like slightly smaller. Yeah, and they're only like forty yards long or whatever. You know, yeah. it could be the imperialism. It looms like uh, that's where I'm coming from. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, you're just like British yeah. people. Uh, you know, Fred, you've done a lot of different uh, British characters. Do you have a particularly favorite sort of uh, accent dialect that you go after? Particularly your punk characters, I always find entertaining. I think I can just do Cockney. Yeah, I can just do London. I as much as like I've tried to like, you know, hear the difference between. Birmingham and Leeds it's like I can't get there I don't hear it enough and once I realize that I you know it's out of my reach I just let it go I'm like I can't I can't attempt Birmingham or or whatever yeah maybe maybe some Glasgow but I'm not gonna try it now no okay no I wasn't asking you to perform I just was curious I, I know you've you were you were in your own way you were asking me to perform and that's okay <laughs> I, I'm used to it <laughs> Fred that's I, one of the things that's always impressed me about you as a performer like there are a lot of people who are funny or they have a talent and they can do a thing they're facile with a certain thing or another but you have this like uncanny ability with mimicry but not like not like mimicking a person's voice, but the essential nature of yeah. the thing that you're trying to evoke. Like you, you have these characters and then, you, you know, there'll be something about your affect that changes when you go from one character to another. And it's not just like you're talking different, but like your whole, like the structure <laughs> of your response to the world changes when you move from character to character. Like, well, when did you notice that about yourself that you could like evoke a completely different personality. And do you, I mean, do you think it's like, uh, and do you think there is some psychological aspect? Like you may have the, you know, some vestige of a multiple personality kind of thing? I think so. It's almost, or I, you know, I, I used to do it for like uh, my dad when I was a kid. And so like I would do impressions of people from like where we lived, you know, in, in Valley Stream in, in Long Island. Yeah. And, Oh, man, how do I put this? There was there was like a uh, a handicapped notion hmm. to two of them, and I didn't mean any, anything mean. I didn't do it in front of them, but I would do it for my dad, and he loved it. And somewhere in there, like just the act of doing it, of like doing an impression of someone, it just became like a, something that I I could do. Hmm. But I don't, you know, I, somewhere in there it started, and then like the, all the usual stuff, like teachers classmates all of that but you know for my friends and stuff yeah so acting you were getting into acting a little bit and it impressed your father in particular it seems like yeah like just mimicry like, yeah. like doing an impression of of this guy down the street who was like you know not all there yeah i understand um, yeah steve uh, you're yeah. funny do you ever do impressions like do you have a solid no. never not i a have I have no facility for impressions whatsoever. Like I, uh, yeah, whatever humor I have is, is is a purely intellectual construction. It doesn't have anything to do with a natural ability or, you know, like I have a, I, I would assume that from playing music for a long time, I have a reasonable sense of timing and like I can anticipate like yeah. interacting with other people and stuff. But yeah. um, like I'm not, I'm not a thesp, you know? No, I think, can't. Yeah. And you don't care for the thespianism. That's my read on you from our various you know, conversations. When I was in, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I like did school plays and stuff, and I was on the speech team, and oh. you know, like I had, but it all seemed like bullshit. Like wh while I was doing it, I was like, "This is not me. Like I'm, I'm not yeah. enjoy, you know, I'm not good at this. I'm just, you know, this is like a thing that I'm kind of fighting my way through." And uh, it was kind of a relief when I, when I got to college and I didn't have to pretend <laughs> to be interested in. It speaking in public you know yeah i think it's a, the which, pretending right you don't care for all of the pretending there's something something rude about just the the whole fictionalizing of an, a human experience in yeah. person yeah. like when i like when i read about something like somebody writes fiction and i read it 
they're evoking something in my head, yeah. which is my business, you know, like the way I, I just read that, you know, the way I think that person looks <laughs> is my business, you know, and I'm fine with that. Like for some reason, there's like a, I can, there's like inside my psyche, there's a distinction between that and somebody putting on a show for me, yeah. which I re, I just sort of instinctively reject. And I think that's why I like comedy among the performing arts. I think that's why I like comedy very specifically, even comedy that's not like, I mean, sort of just very broadly speaking comedy, like stuff that's not funny, that's more like narrative or whatever. Yeah. I think what I like about it is that I don't feel like somebody is bullshitting me. I feel like they're they're trying to get me to see something from their perspective or they're trying to make get me to make an observation about someone, you know. Yeah. I uh I'm in, in agreement about watching dramas, watching plays. It, it does feel rude. Cuz yeah. cuz <laughs> sorry. Cuz it's so because there's there's silence all around like when you watch a play <laughs> There's so much quiet yeah. that I can hear myself breathe. I could feel myself breathe, and I, 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 don't, I, don't like that, I don't like that feeling. Yeah, I can I, I so, can I can appreciate that. But Fred, you did a thing earlier where you sidestepped my uh, invitation to do an impression. Uh, so Steve yeah. and I, we're not gonna when we're in public. No one's gonna be like, "Hey, do the thing." You probably encounter this. Hey, can you do the thing? Uh, do you feel pressure to perform when you're? Just being Fred walking down the street and someone encounters you? I, I don't mind it all, though. Because okay. if someone says, oh, my kids love whatever sketch, do th this thing. Yeah. I, it's easier and fun just to knock it out okay. and just do it. It's, it, it, it's I, short. I, I, yeah. I think that gets to something about the, the arc of your actual career in show business, which is that, you know, you being asked to do bits – from your professional life as part of your normal life. I mean, that's your performing started is in your normal life, just like trying to bust up your friends or trying to like mock your coworkers or whatever. Or your father trying to impress your father. Yeah. 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 So it's so. not, it's not like, you, you know, it's not like, you know, asking Johnny Bench to like <laughs> crouch and pretend <laughs> to catch a, a fastball. It's like, do that thing that originally animated you about performing anyway. Do that one thing that you love to do. Uh, yeah, just a little, yeah. a little bit here privately for me for no money. Can, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Can you imagine someone approaching but, Johnny Bench and Jason? Can you just crouch? Can you just crouch for me for a little bit? I gotta. But you know they they must have done it to Muhammad Ali. Like I'm just figuring oh, for yeah. photos. Oh yeah, probably. They must have, he must he must have been like I can't. This fist thing is making me. Like, <laughs> I do it again, <laughs> pretending to punch someone. Like, God, I can't. I can't do one more of these. <laughs> well, I can't wait to. This is great. I really appreciate you both being here. Uh, I thought about uh, things that you have in common, and we're going to get into a lot of them as we talk about Chicago and whatnot. But one thing that occurred to me uh, recently is that, uh, and at this point in time, you both have now been interviewed and interacted with Conan O'Brien. Uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit because, uh, Steve, I want to say uh, in my YouTube subscription feed thing uh, a couple months ago now, I don't know when it was, I saw a thing. And it was you with uh, Chris Novoselic, Dave Grohl, Conan O'Brien. And I, I, at one point I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Steve's talking to Conan. Uh, I know that guy. That's what I said. And then I thought, uh, wait, they're at Electrical Audio. Like I looked at it more closely on my telephone. I was like, oh, wow, he went to Chicago. Conan went to Chicago. Now, just for, can you guys see a photo of Conan up on my yep, wall? I, I love it. Conan O'Brien. Uh, I always have. I have a videotape of his first uh, late night show on a VHS tape in my basement. Steve, tell us about the experience of Conan coming to Electrical. I want to know that first of all. What was that all about? Well, that was, that whole thing is to do with a, a series of, of interviews that, Dave and Chris Novoselic were doing around the 30th anniversary release of the In Utero album, which is the album that I, as, as a footnote, that I worked on as the engineer. Yeah. And Dave and I have re remained relatively close. We text with each other often, and he's done stuff. Uh, he, my, my wife runs a charity in Chicago, and uh, Dave has done stuff for the charity to ra help raise money for the charity. And uh, he and I are 
on on friendly terms. I and I'm in good terms with Chris Novoselic, but we're not intimate at all. Like I don't. Yeah. He doesn't text me, right? Mm-hmm. But but Dave and I will like you know we ha- there's like a ten year old ten year long text thread between him and me where we like talk about various uh, absurdities that we run into, and we you know we ha- and we know a lot of people in common, yada yada. But my work schedule is often decided many, many months in advance. Mm-hmm. Like my time, and someone schedules a trip to Chicago to record an album for this period and they book me to do it. Uh, there's no way that I can just say, hey, guys, can we bump that a couple of days so that I can go to L.A. and be in this interview? Yeah. Like it's just it's just not viable. So the only way that I could participate in a, a kind of a roundtable about that record would be if they did it here and they were all like, yeah, that's fine. Oh, <laughs> you know? that's amazing. You know, yeah. Well, the, uh, Chris Novoselic is a private pl- pilot. Like he owns uh, a plane that he flies around whenever he needs to get anywhere, which is kind of incredible. But <laughs> like, if you're gonna bother being a rock star and making millions, like you, you kind of want to have something like that. Like, and you know, and and I have a plane, you know. Like you kind of want. You know, it's, not, it's it can't all just be like, yeah, I paid off the mortgage, and you know, I have a nice four hundred one k. You know, like it's like you really want to be able to say you have some, you know, like. You know, like oh, yeah, I have a stable of thoroughbreds, or yeah, like yeah, yeah. I own, and I have a plane, like it, something like that is kind of amazing. And he manages to do it in a way that's not douchey at all. Like he is his own pilot. It's not like he has a pilot that flies himself places. Like yeah, he and his wife will just hop in the Cessna or whatever it is. I don't. I actually I say Cessna just because I know that that's a brand <laughs> of plane, it's a kind of plane. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, but they'll just like hop in and fly someplace for funsies and i think that's incredible you know yeah. so did he fly did chris novoselic and or his wife fly conan o'brien dave grohl and everyone else uh, no, to chicago no, no. no okay i just i think sure. he was just i think he was just <laughs> he just he flew himself and his wife here nice. but then uh, so i i like those guys and i'm not a nostalgic person so it, um very i it's not like i spend a lot of time ruminating on things that have happened in the past yeah. but as you can imagine somebody who's involved in a nirvana record gets asked about the nirvana record a lot and so i have you know like formulated my thoughts about that experience and that record i've had reason to like yeah like yeah. re-examine my relationship with it over the years and i enjoy talking to them about that sort of stuff because you know we had this common experience a long time ago and everyone else has been sort of barking at us from the outside about it so it was, it was kind of rare for the three of us to sort of relive that like brief two-week period of intimacy where we got to know each other and that yeah. was kind of cool the other thing is that they're all incredibly tall <laughs> like chris novoselic is like six six or yep. six eight mm-hmm. and uh conan o'brien is like six five or six six mm-hmm. and the the production guy from the conan o'brien podcast that was there organizing everything whipping everybody in the building that guy was fucking six five like i felt mm-hmm. i felt like i was grumpy from snow white you know <laughs> <laughs> uh what was the actual what was your impression of conan I don't think you impress easy, Steve, but were you like, oh, my God, Conan O'Brien's at my workplace? Super quick on his feet. Like, I admire his wit, you know, yeah. like the 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 quickness and the facility he has with making things, like, be funny. I actually, like, I was, I've never... I don't. I don't want to be rude, but I. I mean, I don't rate talk showing as like a as an art form. Mm. But there are clearly people who are better at it than others, and he is obviously like one of the very best yeah. in the world at yeah. keeping a conversation flowing and yeah. making the guest feel like they're safe and open, and they can be open, but still, like not just you know blowing smoke all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Fred, have you gotten to know Conan at all, given some of the circles you uh, roll in? Yeah, over the years, he was. It's the first talk show I was ever on. Be- oh. Before I was on SNL, I, I went on doing stand up. And then just over the years, just, you know, being on his show, it was like in the same building. Yeah. So he would be in the, you know, it was like two floors away. So I would see him. And then after his show was done, we've just, I don't know, been at the same places. Yeah. And he, um, he wasn't a writer at SNL when you were at SNL? No. No, it, no was, he would uh, have been done. Yeah. He was gone already. Um, and then we've had like dinner and stuff and there've been like sort of uh, comedian get togethers in LA in yeah. the past couple of years that were really fun. 
Have you ever talked? But anyway, have you ever talked? But music? he's great. He's, he's yeah, he's the best. Do we talk music? Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's he's a guitar player and is really into it and like really gets into talking about like Beatles guitars and stuff and 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 like Steve said, he's got like he's really fast, really witty, yeah. and he's you know I've been to a lot of events that or charity things that they've asked him to host. And he's so good at that. Yeah. He's like, he's one of those, he, I, I'm just like re-explaining who he is, but like <laughs> he makes it tr- like truly funny. He, you know, he's like, he steps outside of it a little, a little bit. Well, I think he's Memorials under, and stuff and, and just, yeah. I, somehow the host of the Tonight Show and his own show and, and the late night, I think he's underrated. Like, I think he's the best still and he's not doing it anymore. And I just want to say that for the record. And I appreciate that uh, we've all said nice things about him because I think he's <laughs> yeah. great. I wonder, Steve, was he curious about the recording studio just given his interest in music? Because uh, there's a kind of a truism that my wife clued me in on many years ago, which is that all comedians are kind of frustrated musicians yes. and mu- music dorks, music nerds, and to a very high degree. And, you know, almost. Equivalently, musicians are kind of frustrated comedians or other kinds of like, you know, funny performers. And, you know, I've never felt frustrated. I've always felt like being in a band is like a perfect vehicle to like bust balls and be funny if you want to. Mm-hmm. Like absolutely perfect for me. Like I, I have no ambition. I would I would be uncomfortable if all I was doing was trying to be funny. But if you have something funny or bastardly to say, you know, just before you count off the song is the perfect time to do yes. it, you know. Yes. So I've never mm-hmm. felt frustrated by that at all. But but my wife has a really like kind of disdainful uh, way of like, like her eyes roll like in, in a way that you can hear them turning. You can hear the bearings turn like, break, or, you know. Well, I think of both of you as both very funny and very musical. And I want to get into that. Uh, as we as we go here, but I I think it's probably a good time to figure out how you two kind of uh, inter uh, intersected for the first time. Uh, I think you're both transplants to Chicago, if I'm correct. Uh, both arrived sometime in the '80s. This isn't a census part of the interview. I'm just facts. I think Steve, you were there early '80s. Is that right? I moved here in 1980. Yeah, this, the so, my freshman year at Northwestern started in the fall of 1980. I drove out here at, at the end of the summer. Yeah. and yeah, yeah. And Fred, and then, I got there in 1988. 88. Yeah, and sorry, what what was that for, Fred? What did you move there for? For my band, uh, I was yeah. in a band with Damon Locks and Wayne Montana, and we we moved out together. Like Damon had to go to school at the art institute oh okay and i was in a band with him in new york and we just came out with him okay just you know and sort of like from new york is like very expensive to to try to run a band and it's it's really hard and chicago just seemed i mean it was the damon was going to school there but it was also just easier easier to go to other cities and stuff and but i uh, and i'm getting ahead of you i know but like (laughs) i first knew steve by reading his like letters he'd write and stuff, and well, for his music, of course, yeah, which already said a lot about his sense of humor. But I always thought he was so funny, and I was a fan of his music, but then also of him. I was like, this guy is so funny. <laughs> it was just like he really like <laughs> caught into Chicago. The thing that I most disliked about, I wonder, I love Chicago. I yeah, yeah. no disrespect to Chicago, but like he sort of like chiseled away at it. And I was like, I wanted to cheer. I wanted to stay. I was like, yes, <laughs> that's what I need. So what What was that? Can you pinpoint that? <laughs> just a couple of things. I don't want to, well, it was just a couple of letters he wrote. Well, first one, he wrote a really good article about getting signed. It was so good because it was also smart. Because he wasn't just like, Oh my god, I'm talking about it like he's dead. But Steve's like, here. And for everyone listening, that, Steve is he, here. He's alive. It's just that he was like, it's not that he was ripping things apart to, just to put him down. He was just like, what is the logic yeah. of the way you're talking about bands? Yeah. What is this? Like, but then he also broke down, like, what does it mean for a band to be signed? Like, you know, when they go to, you know, that they charge you, like major labels, they charge you for that video you want to make. Things that were like really, I don't know. Important to know. I'm like, this is something everybody should know. And I felt like everyone was kind of scared 
to like shake anything up to say things. There I don't was know. A, he was just funny as the, hell. The thing that got me sort of that sort of made me want to say something about that period. There was definitely a, a, a moment when stuff that had been percolating in the underground was starting to get attention in the mainstream. And that meant there was an infusion of money and that the sort of like professional class of the music industry was going to start getting involved in one way or another. And then there was a, a certain personality type within the underground that was like fucking eager to get into that. Yeah. You know, like, oh, this is my shot, you know, and yeah. I, I wanted to temper that a little bit because it was so just so patently dangerous yeah. to like turn your attention and your uh, your this you know your life's work over to an industry that has a long history of just chewing people up yeah. and so it was kind of a it was essentially like a um a warning to my peers and i consider all these people my peers it's not like you know i was speaking down to them from some omniscient perch or anything it was just yeah. like everybody around me is trying to get signed and I, I don't think they realized that that would be really bad. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Fred, you said something about the, the logic and the humor and what Steve was conveying. And I, it got yeah. me, it got me thinking, do you think logic is an underappreciated aspect of comedy? Cause I think that's what the comedy I gravitate towards is pointing out smart things, logical things that we take for granted or don't take into account. Is logic a big part of comedy? Do you think? Definitely. Yeah. But. Or and <laughs> the hard part is like using the right words for it. Hmm. So like it's one thing to like to talk, you know, to make things logical or to, to talk about logic. But like it's also being succinct with your words. So that's what I appreciated about Steve is like th his use of words. That's where it like really worked for me. There were it was almost like comedic pieces to me. So that was like, by the way, side note, I wasn't following any comedians or going to see comedy when I was in Chicago. Right. That was my comedy. The reading what he wrote was like, that's what I laughed at. I, I, I saw not one comedian, not one. But also like you, like in the music underground, there's like little things that substitute for other things. Like instead of going to church, you go to shows, you know, and instead of having like a rotary club, you have like the regulars at the bar that you're at or, you know, like or, or the record shop that you go to, like serves as your library or whatever. Like there's yeah. like these cultural equivalents or whatever. And Fred would hold court at the lounge acts where where he worked. But in a really different way from somebody who was trying to be a commanding presence. He would just be there like silently mocking or silent, you know, doing this. I, I spoke before about the way his, when he's doing an impression of somebody or a caricature of something, it's not just talk funny or like, you know, do an Elvis pout or whatever. It's yeah. like, there's something about his affect and the way he carries himself that is recognizable as this character that he's presenting or recognizable as him mocking Dan Koretsky, who just walked by or him mocking, you know, anyway. Yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so. Whatever. OK, I get it. So, Fred, what were you doing at Lounge Acts exactly at that time where you could afford I... to spend time silently mocking everyone in your <laughs> field of vision? I worked for Sue Miller, well, the co-owner of Lounge Axe, and I worked in her office, I guess, you know, with like booking and just like everything was phone calls. So every day phone calls would come in and, you know, for bands trying to get booked, it was an all day thing. Uh, so there, there was a whole, <sighs> there was like a whole system for like, you know, bands had to send in their tape and a little press kit and a photo. Right. They'd call after two weeks. There was like a lot they had to go, you know, that's just the way that, you know, bands got booked. Pre-internet, um, there then, was no other way, yeah. But this, is yeah how we all, and, this is how we all did it, yeah, of course, yeah. And it's also how Sue could like listen to the music. Like there wasn't like looking right. up their website or anything. It was just like, listen to the tape. So I was down at the office like fielding calls and, and you know, opening uh, envelopes and stuff. But then... On some nights, I would work the door, oh, okay. which is just, you know, getting, you know, yeah. 
as people, people paid to get in and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. um, so that was it, but it was like a, a good long while of doing it. And I became really close with Sue and, you know, it was great seeing that part, that aspect of bands coming through. Okay. And Fred, Fred used to host the karaoke nights at Lounge X. Lounge X, like there were, there were bars that sort of featured karaoke and then there were like sort of watering holes that would have a karaoke night that would be kind of generically like the dude comes in with the karaoke machine and sets it up and you do karaoke but lounge acts had a, a much different clientele and the karaoke nights absolutely catered to that clientele with this you know the kind of music that people could sing to and mm. like the kind of people that would, you know it was an alternative kind of karaoke night and fred would host them often in character which was incredible. Like I remember one time he showed up a, as a mugging victim. Like he had his computer clothes were completely disheveled. He had a fucking shiner and a bloody bloody lip, and one of his teeth was blacked out. And he's like, "Okay, everybody, let's, let's welcome to the stage our first singer." And, uh, wow. And, uh, uh, I mean, that the, his that was one of the things that distinguished the karaoke nights at Lounge X from like a conventional karaoke night is that it was you knew it was going to be something bigger and better and funnier and more fun than just you know people singing their favorite Journey songs or whatever. Although that did happen. I feel like mm -hmm. both of you exist in sort of uh, milieus that we were, we were talking about how they uh, come together from time to time. But I feel like you both look at your peers sometimes and think, I think everyone's taking themselves a little too seriously. Uh, is that a fair assessment, Fred? Like, I can't... Yeah, but like, yes, but the older I get, the less I care. Okay. So like, yeah. I used to be, I used to think, oh, they're all, you know, I think about people taking themselves too seriously. And then after a while, I'm like... Oh, I don't care. That, that's that's how they want to live. Fantastic. Yeah. So there's a thing that if you're in this peer group of a bunch of people and everybody's sort of throwing elbows and everybody's like sort of calling everybody else a dickhead and stuff like it, there's a sort of an egalitarian effect where everyone is equally being like clowned on at, at all times. And it and it feels good to be in a community of people where everybody nobody has a chip on their shoulder where everybody's fair game and you know like the whole thing is like roiling with this kind of good-natured but energetic sort of ball busting that feels really good and then there are people who feel like they are above that to an extent or, or they give off the impression that they should be treated better than that and those people make themselves known very quickly and those people are the people that that sort of engender resentment among everybody else. Like, yeah. like, can't you just be part of the crowd and enjoy yourself as as one of us? Or you, you know, it's really important for you to be top dog. That that's like a thing yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that, when you say taking somebody taking yourself too seriously, I think it's having an impression of yourself that outstrips your value to the scene or to to the world at large like there are people in that in those circles like john langford was a regular at at lounge acts and sally timms you know like and fred fred was married briefly to sally timms like these are internationally famous people you know hugely influential artists and musicians but they were fine with being made fun of at karaoke night at lounge acts or whatever like it was not you know and that's that just gives you an indication of like that there were some people, you know, who had, you know, they put out their first demo and they felt like it hadn't gotten sufficient attention and, mm -hmm. you know, they had a chip on their shoulder about their first demo, you know, like yeah. that, that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. I think Fred, karaoke in itself, I mean, these days anyway, it's inherently silly and fun. Uh, funny. It's meant to, you're not supposed to take it too seriously, but I imagine you came up with characters because there's something about it that maybe seemed serious or something like were people taking it too seriously like or did you see the no, host and think um, what, what is with these hosts taking it, it so was, seriously it was le it was more like i just wanted it to be an event like <laughs> okay. i just wanted it <laughs> yeah. i yeah. loved lounge acts so much that yeah. i wanted it to be special uh, as opposed to just perfunctory like yeah. okay here's the next person coming up to sing i was just i just thought let's really you know make it fun 
Sounds like you were just a you're a born entertainer, Fred. You were just born to entertain. It's true. <laughs> Some of those like Lounge Jack's characters ended up being recurring characters in Fred's stand up, like uh, Poetry Slam Girl. Yep. Was a origin that was originally a, a character that he used in as part of the karaoke night. I see. Yeah. And, and and kind of like the like what would end up on Portlandia. The yeah. Poetry yeah. girl. Yeah. And I think I, I was Jesus Christ at one um, at one of them and of course I of course like you would done be. them a, a yeah. bunch of times. Were you off were you ever officer I can't remember if you were officer Fred of the Minneapolis no. police. No. <laughs> I don't okay. think I don't think I <laughs> I don't think I did in there. <laughs> there, there was a one of the things that was amazing about Lounge Jacks was that it was one of the very few bars that had live music where you could go and hang out and enjoy yourself regardless of whether or not you were there to see the band. It was just a really great bar. Like their ads in the newspaper said, a great place to drink booze and hang out or something, or a great place to drink booze and listen to music, and like. I mean, I don't drink, Fred. I don't. I don't think you nope. drink either. No, yeah. me neither. I don't drink but either. Look at us. There's like hey. a, there, but it. <laughs> I mean, I I enjoyed going out with my friends when my friends were going out drinking because it sort of everybody else sort of loosened up and it's yeah. sort of like like they sort of operated on our level then because they were the booze sort of oiled them up and let their machine yeah. work a little looser, you know. Yeah. yeah. And Lounge Jacks had a little sign behind the bar that said "No High Fives" because that was during <laughs> the period of. Like, you know, sports enthusiasm was, you know, like really a, like the bro contingent sort of identified each other by high fiving. And then there was a, an addendum post it put on it. It said, except on karaoke night. Oh. <laughs> karaoke <laughs> night was really like that was the one spot where you were allowed when it wasn't gauche to high five people. Well, that's lovely. That sounds very lovely. And uh, Steve, I gather from what we're talking about, maybe this is true. Did you first encounter Fred at Lounge Axe? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I may have seen Trenchmouth somewhere, and uh, but if so, Fred as a personality didn't didn't register. It was just like I saw the band, you know. But I think, I think though, maybe I'm getting my times mixed up. But like, I think there was a time where Steve came to a show at this other bar where Rachel's was playing. The band Rachel's. Yep. And I feel I have this weird feeling that like that's the first time I met him. I don't know why, but it's huh. like the first time I registered him is like in front of me and uh, like engaging with him. I do remember very distinctly you doing an impression of Sue Miller on the telephone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sue Miller is the owner of Lounge Jacks, and yes. she was in the state of constant exasperation constant yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and like nothing ever went it's not just that nothing went right everything went wrong you know? very wrong yeah. yeah it's a thank it's a thankless business i think we can all agree what yeah. sue uh, did there so but, so did she enjoy I, I the can, impression though fred well, I, did can, she... I can i can do a mimic <laughs> of fred's impression okay. of sue miller yeah. and Please. this is this is the entirety of uh, Fred's impression of Sue Miller, and it, I think the the economy of it is one of the is like an example of how brilliant Fred is at evoking a character with the subtle and nonverbal aspects of the personality that he's evoking, and, and this is it. Oh, fucking Mark. <laughs> there you go. That's 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 there's Mark that's, also worked for her. But the, there's the, yeah. but the ugh, like yeah. the, 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 the <laughs> Mark. <ugh. laughs> so Chicago, uh, I think, uh, based on my experience, is this hotbed for comedy, for some of my favorite music. Uh, I want your impressions of it, and maybe maybe your perspective, like your perspectives on why. It might be this special place. Uh, Fred, you've alluded to some of this in terms of comparing it to New York. Yeah. But why do you reckon it's this hotbed for such great comedy? And and even the, I think just a high level, uh, a commitment to excellence, I think, in music and arts generally is how I would, I don't mean to over flatter you Chicago people, but I, I, I have a fondness for it and I hold it in high regard. Fred, do you have a perspective on what makes Chicago kind of special for the stuff that you and Steve do and have done? Well, I, I think from my experience, it's, some of it might be economical, that it's affordable and that it's like not glamorous. So I think it attracts people who really want to work on something 
as opposed to no no disrespect to Los Angeles, but like the you know the attraction of LA, it's like slightly different. I think that the cold also like gives you the right uniform to make art, like flannel shirt, you know, <laughs> zipped up jacket. I so then you've got your canvas, <laughs> or your guitar case and your drum case. It's just like it matches, and that was like the. This is like not exactly what you're asking, but like I noticed that like I've never since experienced a city that had such a, a strong tradition of recording studios where people had studios that they really had, they really worked on and had pride and they weren't like they weren't bragging about, you know, the newest equipment that they had. There was something like, I don't know what it is, it's curated or something, I don't know, but... There's like a recording studio thing that I really, I have never seen anywhere else. Huh. And that's, Steve, is that geographic, uh, uh, what's well, the word? I mean, part of it is like, if you wanted to go to one of the traditional music centers in the U.S., you know, L.A. or New York, that's a long ass drive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even, God forbid, Nashville is like six or seven hours away. Mm -hmm. So... In order for there to be an active music recording scene in Chicago, like we kind of had to do it here. We couldn't use the resources of elsewhere. We kind of had to do it here. Yeah. And the punk scene had the benefit of having a few very specific entrepreneurial guys. Tim Powell had a, a van with a four track machine in it and he would drive all and all over town and record like live shows for bands. He did a, had a radio series the WXRT radio station in Chicago had a, a thing called the Unconcerts or something. I can't remember. But he hmm. he would just record shows at various bars around town, and then they would broadcast them on WXRT, which was, you know, kind of an incredible thing, you know. And then he made himself available. His roommate was a guy named Terry Nelson, who was a punk DJ hmm. at a college station. And so all of his friends were punks, and he recorded all of the punk bands. Like, he recorded the first Effigies record, which is a fucking masterpiece, you know. And he, you know, and he recorded the Busted at Oz album, which was like the scene document of the early punk scene in Chicago. And then Ian Burgess, who is an English guy that moved to Chicago, he moved to the U.S. when he was like 12 years old, but he had meticulously maintained his accent as a kind of a, a way to impress ladies, um, you know. So he had this kind of Americanized parody British accent that he would unroll when he got a little liquored up. It was really great, very entertaining, but he, he was an engineer. He worked at a couple of different studios in town and he became very friendly with the, the punk scene and the underground scene. And he, you know, went out of his way to make, make it easier for those bands to record records. So all, all of the, like from the very beginning, the Chicago punk scene, like once it started being documented, that was done you know, to a much higher standard than in a lot of places where like stuff was done really, you know, like in really cheap shit ways and by people who were, who were not involved and didn't care, yeah. you know, like people who yeah. are sort of, you know, like you've paid for these eight hours. So I will record your fucking single, you snot nosed brats, <laughs> you know, yeah. as opposed to like people who were sort of seen as peers within the music scene and energetically and excited about it and i think that was the difference like and that sort of made a template like you'd go to other places and in every other town there would be a guy kind of like ian or kind of like tim who would be like oh that's the guy that has the tape machine and he'll make records with us and you know like there was a guy like that in every scene yeah and i thought i think that's a natural outgrowth of having a music community that's like a bunch of peers who are all trying to make sure that things stay afloat rather than somebody like sort of trying to extract value from the scene by like, hmm, a lot of bands. I bet I can open a studio, yes. you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Fred, you moved to Chicago for music reasons, you said, from New York. Yeah. Did you find that you were able to thrive in the music uh, community? Um, Thrive. Sure. I mean, we got to like travel and play in Madison and Minneapolis and in Michigan. And so it was e really easy for touring. Yeah. And yeah, in, in my, you know, I got to play a lot and I got to be in a band. I definitely wanted to be able to make a better life for myself as, as a musician. And it didn't work uh, as quickly as it did when I started doing comedy. As soon as I started, started doing comedy, th things changed very quickly and drastically. In fact, I feel like comedy is what like, 
you know, sort of bonded my friendship with Steve. One of the first things I ever did was a, a fake interview with Steve. So yes, my music career, as it were, thrived. It was fine for, for what it was, but then at some point I had to start doing comedy. I wanted to just start doing comedy. Did you get to be funny in your bands? Like, could you? Yeah, there were times yeah. where I would talk on the microphone from behind the drums and I found a lot of enjoyment in whatever, for whatever reason, or I can't recreate whatever the jokes were, but no, no, I, did, yeah, it's fine. I did try to, you know, whatever. I, I, I used the microphone when I could. So there were there were there were bands that had a significant like element of humor or where there was an aspect of the band that was meant to be like taken that way. I'm mm -hmm. I'm thinking of bands like um the Bitter Tears who were very they were a very theatrical band. They had a lot of costumes and just absurdist theater almost simultaneous with the music and there's a guy named Ryan Murphy who is part of the Drag City uh organization but he was also a musician. He had a band called Mantis that was like fundamentally had like had jokes at the core of their identity like in jokes yeah. at the core of their identity he did a project for a while called the chestnut station which was a band and the every all the song titles for the chestnut station songs were taken from the marquee of a movie theater downtown called the chestnut station mm -hmm. hmm. and chestnut station movie theater had all of these films up on it and so like they had a song called 101 dalmatians because the, the film 101 <laughs> dalmatians was, they had a song called double impact because there was a film right. called double impact right, right. Uh, like there there were these sort of conceptual you know and a lot of and there was also like a kind of an absurdist wing to to that where like there were like weasel walter and the skin graft bands right. where there was yeah. like and Cheer Accident, for example, who like maybe 70 percent of Cheer Accident is a joke, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. they're, 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 you know, this is a band that's been running for almost 40 years. Yeah. And at any point you like you could listen to what they're doing. And, and the first question out of your mouth would be like, are you are you serious with this? You know, like <laughs> there's like an absurdist tinge to a lot of the especially the underground scene in Chicago that I think like made for a natural mapping to comedy in different ways. Like there wasn't a lot of like direct crossover. Like yeah. Andy, R Andy Richter lived here, but Andy Richter wasn't like in a band, you know, or hanging out at lounge acts yeah. and all the second city people were here. Like, you know, Stephen Colbert and Steve Carell and Tina Fey and Amy Poehler Sands and Amy Poehler, like all these people. Yeah were here yeah. and being incredibly funny, but they weren't involved in the music scene at all. But the music scene had this like tenor of uh, Fred. I think you're, you're like the only one, aren't you? Like the only person who is actually like fully vested in the music scene and also eventually fully vested in the comedy. Yeah, eventually. World. Yeah. And especially those people, like people like Tina and Amy. Yeah. That just came a little later. I have to say, I was reading Amy Poehler's book when it came out and she's just, writing about Fugazi. And I'm like, what? I had no idea that she had that intersection. But then I kind of thought about, again, the milieus. There is this sort of invisible crossover, it seems, between like the punk scene in particular and the edgier comedians I like. One yeah. of my favorite Patton Oswalt specials has a run about Fugazi. Like he just, <laughs> sorry to keep talking about them, but like that just resonates with me as a yeah. fan of that band and a fan of comedy. And I like that Steve invoked Drag City. Fred, you and I first spoke because Drag City had released this complicated drumming a DVD, which if memory serves, did you not film some of that at Electrical? Yep. Yeah, I remember that too. Sorry to keep talking about stuff that gets filmed at Electrical, but it no, resonates but I, I with No, but I shot me. some of it there. <clears throat> it was a um, fake drum instruction video. Yeah. DVD, because at the time, drummers would put out these DVDs of how to play, you know, <laughs> drums. And they were so funny to me because they'd have close-ups of their feet and close-ups of their hands. And, uh, and then they'd talk about, you know, what they just did. So, uh, yeah, so I shot some so, of them. <laughs> one of that thing, that, that drum instruction video, busted me up. I mean, I as a 
as a musician, like I've been exposed to all of this shit at music stores or like yeah. whatever. I've seen all of these things, and some of the mockery, like some of the some, like some of the send up of that video, is so subtle that like. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're steeped in that culture, you're not going to get it at all, right? Yeah. So there's like there's like a very very small part of the audience that's well versed enough yeah. in the the specific thing that he is making fun of or making you know. And I, the thing is that it, you can tell that it's also done like with a little bit of affection. Like yeah. you can tell that like if somebody's really good at drumming and wants you to get into, you know, wants you to feel what they feel yeah. when they're really drumming, you know, like. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, <laughs> so, I'm a drummer too, Fred. So it resonated with me on a couple of levels, if I might say, I just enjoyed oh, very it good. very much. Uh, no, it's brilliant. Can I, can I, can I just quote my favorite thing from the Jens, uh, complicated drumming video <laughs> that I really, uh, my number one favorite thing about that video is that he would do these, the, he would have there was a score that came with it yeah. that had the exercises <laughs> right and over the course of the video it goes from like fairly simple patterns and normal and like by the the last example the page is just like a, a smear of dots yes. it was like, yeah know, just yeah. right yeah. and that's like a little visual pun right but the while he's teaching the examples and especially the one where he's talking about the double bass drum, like how to alternate your feet on the double bass drum. Yeah. The camera is on his feet and he's saying left, right, left, right, <laughs> left, left, right, right, left, 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 right, 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 left, right, left, right, left, left, right, right. Every time he says left, he uses his right foot. <laughs> Every time he says right, he uses his left foot. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't hear the word flam without thinking of that for some reason. It just always... Anyway, sorry. My main point here, uh, Fred, uh, I want your perspective on Drag City. Steve invoked them. Uh, to look up your tour dates, I, I went to the Drag City page. Yep. There's something about that that label. Your friend John Mulaney has been putting out records on, uh, oh, yeah. on Drag City. What is with Drag City, comedy, underground music? Can you speak to it? I think it's because of uh, Dan and the, just the people who run it. I think they're just fans there's are something funny? else going are they on. Funny? Are they funny? Oh, people? De definitely funny. Okay. Yeah. Extremely um, funny. Yeah. Very, very cut yeah. up crew. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there's something else about the label that I can't, I don't know how it works, but it works exactly right. It, the aesthetics, I just love the aesthetics of it. Yeah. I like their pacing. I, I just, I like this sort of, there's like a little bit of humility, but not fake humility to the way they put out new records. So it's uh -huh. not like, bah, this record's going to change your life. They're like, here's here's one that's coming out. Here's another one. Yeah. We love this yeah. artist. Simple here's as that. one of the 13 records that we're putting out this month. You know, maybe yeah. if, you don't, if you don't like that one, you know, there are others. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, and I really like that. That's very respectful of me as a consumer. Like, that's well, all I need to know. The other part of it is I was, I was speaking with Greg Turkington, Neil Hamburger, uh, on this show recently. And we got Drag into City were early champions of Neil Hamburger. Like absolutely. The first time I ever, first time I heard of Neil Hamburger as a concept or anything was on a cassette tape, like a dubbed cassette. Yeah. Like, and I was familiar with some of those West Coast bands. Like, I was familiar with some of those bands from the music world. Yeah. But like the the idea of that as comedy, like, never percolated in. And then uh, like these people were sort of championing Neil Hamburger. Yeah. And, uh, and early on, very, like a, yeah, very, a long very time ago. Yeah. Well, and again, I have. I've been fortunate to have some uh, association with Drag City. Just they've, I've talked to so many people from that label, and Greg and I have had a long-standing kind of relationship in this capacity. And so we were chatting about Drag City, and we're actually we were talking about people who aren't taken seriously as comedians when they make music. And he pointed out that Bill Callahan, Will Oldham, David Berman, some of the funniest writers, deeply funny people, yeah, uh, funny people, but funny, funny yeah. writers. Like people th think they're so serious and whatever, but like if you actually listen to what they're singing about, they're fucking funny as hell. So I think that's an interesting. The fact that Drag City's in Chicago, I don't know. I just think that's an interesting hub for everything we've been talking about on some level. And um, Steve, are there other examples of this be beyond that label that you can think of? Well, I mean. I, like I had mentioned some of the absurdist bands, but there were also like, like there was a band called Moto, Masters of the Obvious. Paul Caparino and uh, Beck Dudley moved to Chicago, for, I think from either from Boston or it must have been Boston. And they were a two piece band. 
but they would do like truly absurd sets of like 40 or 50 songs, like very rapid fire, super short, really memorable, clever, catchy songs. Every one of them with like some kind of an absurdist or funny premise. Yeah. And then Paul Caprino would also do this human jukebox thing where if you just named any song from like the last 40 years, he would take a shot at it and he would get it, you know, good enough, get it like close enough, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was a, kind of a like a like a supernatural talent in that regard of like just being able to play by ear, yeah. Like song, so, songs certainly he'd never played before, yeah. But he knew how they went, so he would like kind of get it good enough that you could tell what was going on, yeah. and hmm. that kind of yeah, that sort of like well, let's give it a shot kind of deal. Like that's that sort of runs through the whole music scene here. Well, it, it seems to me that uh, after this conversation, as I think about it more. An event like Letters to Santa makes way, or the 24 hour improv thing, it makes way more sense that this would be steeped in Chicago because it's such a multidisciplinary, ambitious event. Uh, Fred, how long have you been kind of uh, contributing to this event that uh, takes place every year? It's been a long time, right? It's been a long time. I mean, I've lost track of the years, but yeah. it's, been a, it's been many years, but I, who knows when I started. I gather and, from yeah. from this rapport why you would be involved, but is there any particular reason why you always agree to as much as you can, like take part? I like the direct result. It's yes. not this. It's not amorphous. It's not like it's not like a concept. It's like directly. It's Christmas. You know, it's Christmas Day. So the, it's like a chari- literal. Yeah, it's a literal yeah. charity. The the yeah. charities sort of motto is the solution to poverty is money yes yeah right and it's really straightforward you do something to collect money from people who have it to spare and then you go give it to poor people and that's it that's the whole thing like yeah. <laughs> there's no it's not sign up for this program and uh we're gonna get them people, to learn th- you know, this you're gonna be yeah. a coder in nine months you'll have all the skills necessary <laughs> yeah. to bootstrap, you know like it's nothing none of that bullshit yeah. at all it's not it's not yeah. like Okay, this is available to citizen residents from the 9,000 block north. You know, it's like, it's, there's no qualifications, no questions asked. It's like yeah. the charity finds people in need, gives them money, and then fucks off. You know, yeah. that's like, <laughs> and that, pretty amazing. to me, yeah. it's such a beautiful simplification of the whole thing. It makes it, it makes it easy to implement. It makes it like, very transparent like there's no question what's happening with any of the money the money shows up and it goes to these people yeah. you know yeah. and there's no like what motives could you possibly have for this like you're not you know using this to bootstrap your way into some board of directors of some kind yeah. it's like this is a it's a very very straightforward very simple simplified version of trying to help people and that's the thing that i think is most special about it yeah. Is that it is it's not trying to be anything greater than this one act of collecting money from people who have it to spare and giving it to poor families so that they their lives are better. The cause is incredible and I've been fortunate to be able to engage with it from afar over the last few years. I always enjoy uh tuning in and uh if that's still the phrase we use in the internet age. Um mm-hmm. uh can you give us I think it's a special year, Steve. That's my sense of it. Two cities. Can you kind of give us a rundown of what's uh, happening and when? Are you able to do that? So on the 5th of December, there's a show in Chicago. John Mulaney has agreed to headline it. It's not a 24-hour marathon show. Mm -hmm. This is like a very condensed version of the event. It's like a gala event where people, you know, pay a lot for tickets and it's a sort of concentrated donation effort. There's a space in the Willis Tower, formerly the, the Sears Tower, called Convene, and they donated the use of their space for the event so that made that gave us a venue to do it for many years it was it was done at the second city and the second city as a sort of an entertainment hub just had a natural audience this is different in that you have to we have to get people's attention tell them about the show get them to buy tickets get them to go to the special place and Mm -hmm. uh, whatever but then there's an a sister show happening in los angeles on the 16th and 17th and that one is a 24-hour 
a traditional 24-hour <laughs> marathon show. Okay. Um, and that's being organized primarily by Emily Candini and her sort of West Coast adjunct. She used to live in Chicago. Oh, okay. She was involved in Letters to Santa and, the, and Second City and the improv community here. And she, you know, a longtime friend of Heather's and mine. And so she lives in L.A. now and she's just using her, you know, network of comedy friends and music friends in L.A. to organize that oh, cool. uh, that version of the show. And yeah, it continually impresses me that the longevity of this thing that started, it literally started with my wife, Heather, going to the post office and discovering that people still wrote letters to Santa and then reading some of those letters and having her heartbreak at what people were saying yeah. in these letters to Santa. And then her nature being like, let's do something for these yeah. fucking people, you know? Yeah. And then she enlisted the help of all of the second city people in the improv community. And they manifested this idea of the 24 hour marathon show, which is absurd on its face. But when you experience it, it really is something special. Like you see, yeah. you know, hour after hour of people like really giving their all to this thing. And by the end of it, you know, people are like fucking hallucinating. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, you know, gets a little wild uh, towards the end. I I would agree. Fred, you're taking part this year, and I I assume or no? Yeah, somehow. I mean, the yeah. dates for the performances. Uh, I'm I'm away in England for one of them, oh. and then Seattle for another one. But we always work something out. We'll figure some way to call in. You might something. be in, and then yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll figure something out, especially since I'll be performing anyway. But then on Christmas is like when I, I show up for the gift del delivery. Yeah. That's oh, okay. You'll be doing that. Yeah, that I, you know, try to be a part of. Uh, it's it's really meaningful uh, for me to have had you both on to talk about this stuff, and uh, I hope it was fun for you guys. Uh, I want to just get to some future plans. Uh, Fred, you got anything coming up that you want people? I know you're on tour, but anything else you want to plug or tell people about? No, I mean it's just. All kinds of stuff. As soon as I hear myself talking about like what, what's coming up, I, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, I, know. I, I appreciate that. No, no, it's very nice of you. I try to. It's be very nice of you. It's, yeah. it's just more that you know. <laughs> as soon as, yeah, so okay. Just all just yeah. Okay, so, but uh, I'm just happy to be here. Steve, annual shellac check in. There were Instagram posts. It seems like something's happening. Where are we at? Oh, sweet Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you as condensed a version of the story of our new upcoming album as I can. Um, okay. In the spring of 2020, Shellac was on tour and planned at the conclusion of that tour to go into the studio to finish recording an album. That tour was interrupted by the first shutdowns of the pandemic, and we had to cut our tour short. And we came home and then we were just sort of out of commission. We had a West Coast tour scheduled for the following autumn. We had to cancel that for COVID reasons. And so we rescheduled that for a year later. Yep. And the next time we saw each other was in preparation for that tour going to the West Coast a year later. At which point, uh, I can't remember if it was Delta or Omicron. I think it was Delta. The Delta variant hit and people were fucking dying again. And yeah. so we had to cancel that tour that we had rescheduled. We had to cancel that tour yet again. But we decided that uh, if we operated under COVID protocols, we could use that time that we had reserved to finish the recording of the album that we were supposed to have finished a year and a half prior. So we finished the recording of our album during that period that we had, that would otherwise have been a tour. And then we started the long, slow slog of getting the artwork and the mastering and the pressing and all of that organized. During that period, the pressing plants got overwhelmed mm -hmm. by a bunch of novelty releases that people were doing partly for Record Store Day and partly because there was a renewed interest in vinyl records, like all of the mainstream and major label artists were doing vinyl releases again for the first time in many years. And so that sort of absorbed all of the press capacity worldwide and so there were these enormous long queues for getting records pressed yeah of a, a year plus uh, yeah. waits at the pressing plants and the pressing plants were really being shitty about it too like record labels that had their whole inventory of record jackets and stuff in in uh warehoused at the pressing plant because that's where they're doing fulfillment 
were just having their shit moved out into the parking lot and destroyed in the elements because there was, you know, they were seen as less important than getting a record store day version of a Britney Spears re-release mm-hmm. or something, you know. And so we started looking for an alternative way to get our record pressed and we found a new pressing plant with a new system that is ecologically better and yes. has, has some yes. yeah. some other secondary benefits. We got some test pressings from them. They were immaculate. It, like these example records that we got were the cleanest records I'd ever seen. You know, wow. No surface noise, really beautiful pressings in every way. So we committed to using them for our record. Uh, all the big black records, for example, were shifted over for fulfillment for new pressings are being done at this new plant. Yeah. Anyway, and where so, is this new plant? In the Netherlands. Um, but they're talking about opening a plant in the U.S. They're going to. This is all future plans. But yeah. at any rate, so then we finished our record, got the masters cut, sent them off for test pressings, thinking, you know, this. This is going to be a no-brainer. It's going to be the easiest thing we've ever done. And test pressing after test pressing was fundamentally flawed and oh. uh, in ways that were unique to this new pressing, new oh. method and new chemistry. And so Bob eventually had to take a trip to the Netherlands to the pressing plant to sit with the guy while he was trying to press our record to make adjustments in the in the fill so that there there was less surface noise, less pre echo, less distortion, like all of these things, and eventually he had to recut the lacquer master to accommodate the limitations of the equipment at this new fancy pressing plant. Longest ass story you can imagine. Every record of ours is always some kind of a fucking ordeal, but it's normally because we have some absurd concept for the cover, <laughs> the art, yeah. That, the art that means that it's just going to be a royal pain in the ass to print it. Like that's normally the hang up is yeah. we're having to reinvent printing a monkey on paper, right? Like yeah. that's this time the printing couldn't be dumber. It's just it's all photographs oh. and and ink. Nothing special. No, nothing weird about the printing. Okay. Well, turns out this new place doesn't press labels into the record the way a record normal vinyl press does you have to print up labels and stick them on adhesively which is slow and expensive and so we tried to figure out a way around that and then they eventually came up with a method of printing directly on the record so we're like great let's do that and then you know (laughs) so we are now at a point where we have approved artwork approved proofs for the printing an approved master, and by this time next week, there's a reasonable chance that we'll have a clean test pressing. Wow. God, okay. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, you know, and so a solid, what is that now? Three years yeah. after we originally intended to finish our record, there's a reasonable chance that we'll have a release date, you know. I don't have a release date for you. No, that's fine. Yeah, but it sounds <laughs> but, like it could be 2024. It could be. Yeah, it's looking like, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, is the record good after all that? Are you happy with it? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm really in. I, I, it's been a while since I've listened to it, yes, you know. Yeah. We finished it a, a few years ago, and I tend to move on. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, we've a lot of these songs we've been playing live, since, you yeah. know, for five or six years now. So they're, you know, well worked into our set and we're very comfortable with all the music. And I'm very fond of a lot of this, a lot of this music. And I'm, I'm I like this album a lot. Oh, great. Well, but the, but the mechanics, just like the mechanical process of getting the record finished and getting a clean pressing and all that stuff is fucking exhausting. And I'm an old man. I'm an old man now. I just, I'm not as flexible as I used to be. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I appreciate the update. I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, I ho- <laughs> hope on behalf of all Shellac fans, we hear the album uh, soon. Uh, Fred, you ever seen uh, Shellac? Many times. Yeah, me too. I like them yeah, a lot. Fantastic. One of my, my, one of my so favorite good. bands. I think they're the best it, live band. Agreed. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Because it's so visual. Yeah. Also. Fred. Like, we we curated an all tomorrow's party a weekend of all tomorrow's two weekends of all tomorrow's parties festivals in England and Fred uh, came and was MC oh. in character for was it both weekends or just one weekend both weekends but was it like uh, 2000? 2000? It's a long ass time ago yeah yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, and it was, it was really <laughs> fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was beautiful. One of his one of his characters is a, a music expert named Niles Covington. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar somehow. Have you ever? You- uh, <laughs> the central conceit of Niles Covington is that you don't know enough about music to like music. <laughs> <laughs> you don't deserve to say that you like music. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Well, uh, listen, I uh, I want to go out on a song, uh, Fred. When Steve and I usually convene, it's like pulling teeth to get him to, to pick a song. Uh, I'm going to go to you on this. Do you want to go out on a trench mouth song or a shellac song, something like that? How about um, Chestnut Station? There you go. Yeah. Pick a song from the Chestnut Station EP that has all the movie titles. Do you want to do that? Uh-huh. Can we do that? Are Let's we allowed do that? to do that? It was in, it, yeah, because it was in the discussion. Uh, okay. What, 101 Dalmatians? Is that a good one? Sure. That's a good one. Great. I hope I don't get sued by Disney for this. All right. This is 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> uh, we will not sue you. Don't worry about <laughs> no, that. I don't think anyone's going to sue you. <laughs> Uh, Fred Armisen, Steve Albini, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed yourselves, uh, and I I really appreciate it, and I wish you the best luck with all your future endeavors and uh, Letters to Santa and all that stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for doing it. Thank you for your extraordinary patience for doing this late at night after having already done a full day's work. No no problem. My my pleasure. You entertained people all day, and then we (laughs) asked you to do it more. (laughs) Hey. And and you I did it. I it. feel very entertained. Did, uh, Thank you so much. Oh, good, good. Oh, my dear, since I met you last summer. Said out the close for you. Who knows exactly?
Very special thanks again to Steve and Fred, in particular Steve, for organizing and uh, engineering, if not producing all of this. Uh, this all came up about because of Steve. Uh, very, very thrilling to have them both on the show, and obviously some great fondness between them, which was uh, nice to uh, be a part of and learn more about, uh, even for just a, about an hour or so. Anyway, Steve, Fred, thank you so much for being on this show. Uh, in this case, it's the 826th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available just about wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode that you've heard about and you're looking for it, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control or follow it on various social media platforms that uh, still exist by the time you hear this, but depending on what year it is, you know. So it's on Facebook. There's a Facebook page. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative, or you can follow me directly on Twitter and Instagram at Vish Kana. Also on Threads and Blue Sky and TikTok and YouTube and all sorts of things. Anyway, I, I'm sure if you uh, are interested in me and the show, you'll figure out how to how to find me. Uh, speaking of uh, interesting links and destinations, please visit Patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to support all the work I put into this podcast. I'm trying to make uh, the show 10 years in. I'm finally like, maybe I should make this my main job. I'm not sure why this hasn't occurred to me before. I guess I've just always wanted to view it as a something I do for fun, but also make a little bit of money. But uh, it's very time consuming, and a lot of work, and I love doing it. Don't get me wrong, but uh, just want to figure out if there's a way to actually uh, help this uh, work that I do uh, turn into money that uh, will support my family and I uh, to live. Anyway, if you're interested in uh, contributing to that in some way, please visit patreon.com slash creative control. Uh, you can see all the tiers and benefits uh, uh, to, you know, uh, support the show. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. I also want to thank uh, Blackbird Music, a wonderful independent record store in Alberta. They've got uh, bricks and mortar locations in Edmonton and Calgary. And you can learn more about them and order records directly from them at blackbird.ca. Also want to thank uh, independent businesses in my old hometown of Guelph, Ontario, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee, and also Granddad's Donuts in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. All of them provide in-kind support for this show. I also want to thank uh, Jim Guthrie, an old friend of mine, lends me music for the show. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you so much for listening to this episode with Steve Albini and Fred Armisen. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll check out all the Letters to Santa stuff uh, that we've been discussing and uh, support local initiatives like it in your own neck of the woods, so to speak. And I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast or follow it and tell your friends about it. And otherwise, I just hope you're well and that we uh, connect soon. Thank you so much. Bye for now. <laughs>